צהריים טובים, שמי רמזי סלימאן, אני מאוניברסיטת חיפה, מהחוג לפסיכולוגיה, ואני אמור להיות יו"ר של המושב הזה. אני רואה שווליד כבר הגיע, אז אני אוכל אולי להתחיל. אנחנו מתחילים באיחור של... אה, אינגליש, אוקיי. סורי. אורי. My name is Ramzi Sulaiman. I am from the University of Haifa, from the Department of Psychology. I am the chair of this session, and I should say of this very distinguished session. And I see that everyone here, uh, and we are ready to start. I think we are late by about uh, five minutes or six minutes. That's no problem. But uh, the rules of the game will be like this. Uh, every speaker would have about half an hour. Please do not take more. And then we will be having about, I guess, about 20 minutes, maybe a bit more, for uh, discussion. I will not, uh, you know, uh, utilize the, the time for my discussion. I would rather have you add your comments and remarks. And then maybe I will summarize in, you know, two, three minutes. That will be it. Okay, so our first speaker is uh, Dr. Yossi Bailin, a former uh, Minister of Justice. And uh, I think maybe the name that is... Uh, most connected with the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. So let's hear from the expert. Yossi. If, if everyone can hear you there, you can stay. Mm. Here I can see everybody, which is important. So thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I really appreciate the, the subject uh, of trust because this is an issue that, uh, about which we have thought a lot during the negotiations, after the negotiations. The usual question is, do you trust them? And the expectance is uh, that uh, there will be an, a yes and or no answer. Yes, we trust. No, we don't which is, of course, impossible. It is impossible in life, in, in private life. It is impossible in, in public life. But still, there is kind of a, if I may say so, an almost childish wish to know that you can trust, or perhaps the other way, saying you cannot trust. I, I remember the, the last meeting which I had with Ariel Sharon, and uh, he, he was very nice to me because uh, we in the merits party actually enabled him to, to keep his, uh, his government for a year between January uh, 2005 to January 2006. And he was totally dependent on our six uh, votes. And uh, we knew that in order to, uh, to support him, it, is not, it was not only not to vote against him in a no-confidence vote, but uh, to support uh, things which we hated, including budgets. So uh, before uh, the withdrawal from Gaza, I came to him in my last effort to convince him not to do it unilaterally, but as a part of the, an agreement with Abu Mazen, who was then the new uh, president of Palestine. And uh, Sharon knew how to be nice to people, even people whom he did not like. And uh, after an hour, which was almost all of it in four eyes, he said to me, Yossi, you know, I appreciate very much your efforts for peace and your belief in peace and whatever, but there is a big difference between us. Well, this was not a big surprise, of course, but, <laughs> but the definition of the, of, of the gap was very interesting and very relevant to this uh, discussion. He said, you trust the Arabs, I don't. You know, it was like a cold shower, not because not because he said it, because, it, I mean, I knew Sharon very well, and it was, had he said something uh, different, it could have been a big surprise. 
the the problem was the the simplicity in which he said it. He did not say, "Yossi, with my experience, I learned, and in some cases, it is very difficult to trust the other side, etc., etc." I don't trust the Arabs, and I asked him, "I mean, you mean the Palestinians or all the Arabs?" And he said, "All the Arabs. I don't trust." Because I said to him, I mean, you are giving Gaza to Hamas. He said, so what? What's the difference between them? You think that, uh, that PLO is different than Hamas? That uh, uh, Mashal is different than Abu Mazen? They're all the same. And Sharon was not a, a, a stupid person. I mean, nobody accused him for stupidity. Though may, well, as you may know, some other accusations but not stupidity. And he was ready to say something like this, as simple as that. I don't trust the Arabs. And I, I remember myself, it was April 2005, leaving his, uh, his bureau, saying to myself, I mean, well, he is not the first rightist prime minister the, the fact that Begin was a prime minister was my biggest shock. So Shamir was not such a big shock, and, and, and uh, Bibi was not such a big shock, and even Sharon was not such a big shock. But to hear it as simple as that, I don't trust the Arabs. As if Archie Bunker <laughs> came to Omema and, you know, Hey, you are the Prime Minister of Israel, how can you say something? I mean, I, and I say to myself, how many Arabs are saying this about Jews? I don't trust Jews. I mean, you can say it about every, everybody and people are saying it. When they take shower, whatever, I don't trust. I don't trust the, 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 my, my neighbors, I don't trust this, I don't trust that. But So, the, the problem is, is a very is a very profound one, but it refers really to the leaderships, not necessarily only to the public opinions, which is frightening. The generalization, of course, not that everybody has to trust everybody, but the generalization, which is, I mean, here I don't have to say it, by definition is so idiotic, is, is a legitimate answer. The mere fact that people say, can say, I don't trust the Poles, I don't trust the Americans, I don't trust the Russians, is crazy. And here you have a prime minister. Okay. So this is why it was interesting for me to put my thoughts in a more systematic uh, structure uh, towards this uh, important uh, uh, meeting. What, what does it mean to have trust in the other side during the negotiations, especially when you don't know the other side. In most of, the, of these negotiations, you don't know the other side. I, I presume that in our special case with the Palestinians, we know each other so much uh, because maybe this was one of the reasons that we never ended the negotiations. It was nice for us to negotiate with each other, but the fact is that we are not strangers to each other. But usually, take the, the negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians, and, and the Egyptians in, in 77, 78, 79. Or even with the Jordanians. These were not necessarily, with the Jordanians maybe more, uh, but but uh, these were not people whom they knew very well. Their families, their problems, unlike with the Palestinians. So what does it mean to trust the, the other side uh, of the table? It is mainly to trust that the other side is serious about the negotiations. Not that it is that he or she, or very few she's, but that the other side is trustworthy, generally. But the question is, are they serious or are they just gaining time 
Do they just want to show a third party, usually the Americans, that they are the, the good boys, not the naughty boys? So the main question, and maybe the most important one, when we speak about negotiations, is to know that you are negotiating with somebody who wants to conclude the negotiations positively. And this is always also the question at home. I mean, are you talking to somebody who is serious, whom you can trust? Not that you can trust to, to give him your fortune and that he will do with it whatever he wants. I mean, not this kind of trust. Trust, I don't have to tell you, is a very, very wide word. But to trust this very specific point of seriousness in the uh, negotiations. My feeling is that trust is not a major component of the negotiations. It is secondary. It might be important at certain points, but this is not the most important thing in the negotiations. You can negotiate with people whom you do not trust. You believe that the, the, it is a meeting of, of interests. You are serious because you want to conclude something. They are serious because they want to conclude something because of their own interests, which are not conflicting at this juncture of history. And you can uh, uh, have an agreement uh, eventually. In many cases, you negotiate with, peop with people whom you don't trust. It is better to know that you cannot trust them rather than to believe that they are trustworthy. But it is possible. And I, 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 did, not, uh, I, I did not read any such research, but I can imagine that many, if not most, of the negotiations are handled by people who do not trust each other. Now, if I'm loyal to, my, uh, to the title of, uh, of my intervention, how can we use this trust in order to convince the others that the adversary is worth trust? It is very difficult. It is very difficult because the negotiators are partisan. You know, you see very often on TV, the defenders of the criminals appearing on TV and say, my client did not do anything. He told me that he did not kill all these 15 guys. You look at it. And you say, thank you very much. I mean, what does he want me to, to do? To believe that because he's getting money as a lawyer from this criminal, and he says that this criminal who looks like a gorilla sometimes did not do anything, I will trust him? He is the one. Sometimes the mother appears and says, my son would not kill a fly. And these things. So, I mean, what do they think? That because she said so, I was, ah, if his mother said so, and she knows him apparently, I must ad admit that the guy is innocent. No way in the world. And the negotiators are the lawyers of the, of the results. I mean, we are the ones who are asked, how come you compromised on both sides? And to say, yeah, but one of the reasons is that we are talking to a very trustworthy uh, partner. They are good people. We can work with them. I can vouch for them. You know, I negotiated with them for months and months, and I, can, I know it is, it is very difficult. Maybe uh, we did it. We are doing it. But in a way, it is naive to believe that our testimonial will be enough. Sometimes when you can use stories for the from the negotiations, which are very specific, you, you open a window to something which might help directly or indirectly in the effort to convince the constituencies 
that something serious is happening. I, I can give you an example which I'm using as a former negotiator in, with public opinion. We are asking, are they really serious? What about Abu Mazen? What about this? What about that? I mean, can, can, I mean, there are people who say, you know, had I known that I could trust them, I would have been ready to withdraw, to, to destroy settlements, but I don't trust. So, one of the questions is about the demilitarization. Are they ready for real demilitarization, the Palestinians? If they want sovereignty, how can they give up on, of, on, on militarization? And here I'm telling a story in which in one of our discussions, it was a pre-formal a uh, uh, negotiation, one of the most prominent Palestinian leaders, who is still a prominent Palestinian leader, said to me, Yossi, do me a favor. Demand the militarization of the Palestinian state. I said, okay, I'm, this is one of our demands, but why are you suggesting it from your point of view? You don't want an army and generals. It's nice. He said, you know, we, we, the leadership of the PLO, we know exactly what does it mean to have a military in an Arab state. If there is a military in the Palestinian future state, we know exactly who will be the leaders. Don't take it as a selfish demand. It's not that I'm worried about my own job. But if you are looking at us, your counterparts, and if you you want that these kind of people who are university graduates or university teachers and whatever will be your future counterparts demand it. I cannot suggest something crazy like that. And more than that, when you raise this issue, I will tell you that it is very problematic for us, very difficult for us. Because if we are speaking about sovereignty, a military is part of the sovereignty. Would you give up on your military? No. Never. Okay. So why do you demand it from us? But eventually, this is my aim. To be, to have a demilitarized state. Now, if you tell this story, People begin to, I mean, it is not enough to say I trust them. But if you tell such stories from the negotiations, sometimes it helps for people who are not totally against to understand that some of the requirements are not as simple as they seem. And some of them really, there are, there is, there are a lot of, of, of examples uh, which are actually a result of the demand of the other side. The other side, sometimes it is us, want them to demand something to which we cannot, we, we would like to say yes. But we cannot, we, we cannot offer it. So this is part of the trust in the negotiations and also part of, the, of our ability to try, I don't want to exaggerate, to try to explain or to convince others that what is happening at least between the two parties of the negotiations, is, is trust and, and seriousness. Now, uh, there is a, another very interesting uh, example. At a certain moment, if you remember, one of the issues were it was uh, the size 
of the Palestinian parliament. We were so afraid that it will be a real parliament, so we had to call it the Legislative Council. And we argued for months and months on idiotic issues like the size of the parliament and the name of the parliament, including the name of the president of the Palestinian non-state, which is the authority, because we were afraid uh, that if we call him a president, he will feel like a president and that the Palestinians will feel that they have a state while they do not have a state. And I, I'm, I, apparently you remember what was the, the idiotic compromise. And the compromise was to, to call the, the, the president Rais in the Arab let, uh, world. And it is called in the agreement R-A-I apostrophe S. No chairman, no president, Rais. You don't know Arabic, tough luck. <laughs> But pe innocent people who read the agreement, the interim agreement, and see the word Rais don't understand what they are speaking about if they don't know the language. But this was the, the ingenuity of the negotiators in order to call Arafat Rais. But this is not the story. The story is that uh, we actually dictated to the Palestinians their system, their democracy. The executive branch, the legislative branch, and the presidency. Now, at that time, speaking now about the early 90s, we had a very good uh, uh, system that we invented, uh, the direct uh, election of the prime minister. It was beautiful and uh, really. Only we could invent something idiotic like that. But uh, we invented it. And uh, Arafat was very happy with it. So when we talked about the, how the, the, the Palestinian president would be elected, uh, the idea was that he will be elected like our president in the parliament, in the Knesset. And uh, Arafat said, don't you have a new law uh, that the, your, your prime minister is elected directly? Of course, then there was no prime minister in Palestine. Yes, we said, but you are not a state, whatever. Now, for Rabin, the whole issue of exactly how will be the democracy in Palestine was not the most important thing for him. Uh, his dream was no Bagats, no Betzelem, for sure for Palestine it fit. And he thought, I mean, a compromise on something like that would be the easiest thing for him. Arafat didn't ask for Jerusalem, not for Bethlehem. He just wanted to be elected like our prime minister directly. Immediately came to me somebody whom all of you know and said, you see, don't do that. Don't do that. You don't understand what you are doing. If the guy is elected directly by the people rather than by the parliament, he will refer only to the, to the people and he will not refer to us in the parliament. There will not be a parliament if he's not elected there. Do whatever you can. I asked him again, when we suggest it, or when we insist upon it, what will you do? He said, you know what? We will say that it is unfair. But if you want to save us, if you want a counterpart, insist upon it. The whole discussion was in Gaza. So, we were in one room, I went to the other room, to Rabin, I said to Mitzchak, you won't believe me now, but this is the story. The guys around him uh, want him to be elected in the parliament. Don't do it in the direct uh, vote. And uh, as I said, for him this was a very simple compromise. 
and he, he submitted to, uh, to Arafat on this while not submitting on other things which were, mu were much more uh, important in reality. Uh, but this is again something which can happen only when there is kind of trust and you can work together uh, with, uh, with the other side. But I, I must say that to say that trust is only positive is wrong. I mean, we should not, in my view, take it as an assumption that trust is positive, and as, since it is so positive, we should just ask ourselves how can we enhance a, a trust between people and negotiators and, and whatever. Of course, speaking about trust between peoples and public opinions, this is for sure positive. But there is a difference between trust in the negotiating room and general trust. And I'll give you my best example for the negative ramifications of trust. The negotiators with the Palestinians, in the different negotiations that we had, did develop very close relationships. We came to each, our, uh, each other's home, and, and we knew the families, and we know the families. And, and we, we felt that it was very different than with Egypt and even with Jordan. There was some kind of proximity between the, the parties, and, and the kind of trust that we had with them from day one did really not take a long while. We did not have to prove to each other that we did not have horns. I mean, it really happened very, very quickly, for whatever reason. So much so that when Rabin asked us not to mention the issue of the settlements in the original Oslo Agreement, we came to our Palestinian partners and said to them, you know, you see what, in, in which situation Rabin is. The, the government is very small. Shas was on the verge of leaving us, which made us a minority government. You know that he is ready, he wants to, 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 to have peace, and he's, he, he is ready to, to break many taboos. But if you, you uh, leave the issue of the settlements as a commitment of Israel to freeze all the settlements as you demand, it might be very di difficult for Rabin. This is what he says, and there is something <laughs> to it. And you know that Rabin did not come to power in order to build settlements. So let us leave it as is. We can tell you, it is Rabin's word, that he will not now begin to build settlements. We are going to have an agreement, a full agreement in five years. Hopefully he will be the one to, to sign it. And uh, don't make it too difficult for him. And this was the downside of trust. Because we trusted each other in the room, which is not so important. In the room, we could speak. We trusted. So they felt inconvenience in rejecting our sincere demand while they had to reject it, and they put by, by their acquiescence to the demands of Rabin, they put us all in an impossible situation in the last 20 years. Thinking about us as human beings, who may be there forever, all of us, the negotiators, the... the, 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 the Prime Minister, whoever, is wrong. We are passing. Others will be there, better, worse, whatever. So, the, in a way, trust is misleading because, because as a result of trust, you feel that you can agree and compromise on things which should not be compromised. And since then, I have a problem with trust, not that I'm against it, 
But I don't believe that this is the most important thing, and sometimes it is negative. And just to end my intervention, the real problems with trust is not necessarily with the other side. There are three levels that, as a negotiator, you meet. One is between you and the negotiators on the other side. Another is between you and your delegation. And the third one is between you and the decision maker. And the, 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 the other two are sometimes more important than the first one. You know that in some, in some instances, when you negotiate with the other side, you have to be introduced to, the, to your uh, delegation. Your delegation. Sometimes you know the others, but you don't know your people. Somebody comes from the Patsar, from the uh, military... Uh, uh, no? Justice. Yeah. Military legal advisor, whom you don't know. Another comes from the Minister of Justice, whom you might not know. Somebody is representing the Prime Minister's office, whom you may know or not. And another is coming from the IDF. I mean, you meet them on the first time half an hour, perhaps, before the meeting. Do you have trust with them? And always the other side is asking, who is really uh, here uh, 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 representing the prime minister? A molho. So it is not the minister who is representing him. It is a, a private lawyer. The, yeah, okay, okay, now I understand. So I have to talk to him, right? Now... The, the, just think about the trust between Molcho and, and whom I don't know, I don't even recognize, and, and uh, Tsipi Livni. They have to build trust. It is not the trust between Tsipi Livni and Sai Barikat or, 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 uh, or Abu Allah. The trust is between the negotiators on each side. Not to speak of, of what is happening between them, by the way, which is parallel, of course because we are, we are speaking about human beings. And the issue of trust be, between the, the decision maker or the prime minister, uh, who will be here today, the former prime minister, and his delegation is the most difficult issue. He is sending to the battle people whom he doesn't trust in most of the cases. <laughs> Bibi trusts uh, Tsipi Livni. He really believes that he is sending her to negotiate and she is doing like a loyal soldier exactly what he expects her to do. Rabin trusted me. Barak trusted Shlomo Ben Ami. No. No. The real problem is not there at all. What is happening in many cases is that in the negotiating room, the two delegations are creating one party vis-a-vis -vis their, their decision makers and trying to convince together the two rival uh, leaders that what they did is not in, in a conflict, in, not in contrast to the interest of the two uh, uh, decision makers. And this is the most difficult thing and the most interesting thing. It is all the time that the, the, usually what is happening the decision makers don't, since they don't trust the, the delegations, they want to do it themselves. Eventually, it was Begin in Camp Davy. It was, it was Ormerd who negotiated with Abu Mazen while Tsipi Livni and Abu Allah negotiated intensively. And it is now, after a while of negotiations, I'm finishing, uh, it is uh, Bibi, and Abu Mazen indirectly. It only shows us the distrust of the prime ministers in the delegations, not in specific delegations, but in the idea that the most important thing that they are doing in their terms are not done by them, but by delegates who are not trust, I mean, who, who cannot be 100% trusted by them, so they have to go. Barack had to go to, uh, uh, to, to negotiate in, yeah, in Camp David and wherever he himself. And usually, by the way, they are the worst negotiators. 
They know nothing about negotiations. But they believe, like Barak said, I will go to Arafat and then I will tell him, Bib and Gurion. <laughs> okay, he thought if you tell Arafat to Bib and Gurion, immediately he will change his mind and, and compromise on everything. And eventually, sometimes they fail. But here, I mean, the, the talks between the dele delegation at nights with the prime ministers after the long day of negotiations, telling him, yeah, Mr. Prime Minister, or whoever his name is, we did that and that and that. This is what you wanted. But they raised another thing, and we need your advice. This is the biggest need of trust which is needed and not always exists. Thank you very much.